All right, I think we can get started now. So I'll kick us off. Thanks so much for joining us for this training session. Um, I'm Becca Kwan, Program Associate for Advancement and Awards at DLF, and I've been helping to put this session together over the past few weeks. Um, the DLF community continues to amaze me with how thoughtful and carefully you uh, do everything you do for um, us for us and um, the volunteers running the session and all of you are definitely no exception to that. Um, we're really looking forward to this chance to give you some logistical information and some tips uh, that will be useful to you as you lead sessions at the forum and related events. So with that, I'll hand it off to Paige and Helene. Um, Paige Morgan is Digital Scholarship Librarian and Scholarly Publishing Officer at the University of Miami Libraries. And Helene Williams is Senior Lecturer at the University of Washington Information School. Thank you both so much for leading this session and thanks to everyone for joining. Thank you, Becca. Yes, thank you very much to everyone for coming in. I'm just going to share my screen. So let's see, there we go. And let me go ahead and turn this to full screen mode. Okay, so welcome to best practices for moderating panels and workshops. As I said on Twitter earlier today, we are doing this for DLF, but I think that potentially it would be useful at many conferences and it's important to both of us, um, which is why, why we're sitting here with all of you. We're <laughs> glad that it's important to everyone. Exactly. Um, and I trust that the slides are that the slides are advancing properly. Um, so you should be able to see both our bio slides. It is not advanced. Oh yeah, well, then screen. let's let's just um, time. Indeed, it says it's resuming the share. Yeah, there we go. Nope. No. Okay. Well, let's. It's. Sharing is paused, bring, not sharing. Okay, so man, we had tested this, but- um, <laughs> It worked for the test, yes. Okay. Insufficiently. Um, I'm gonna just click resume share once more. And if that doesn't work, then I may- I will, um, I will bring them up and, uh, <laughs> and see if I can share. That's working now. That's okay. working now? There okay. we go. All right. Awesome. And Great. Let me just move the chat windows out of the way. So let's see. Um, kicking this off, and please tell me if it does not advance. So we're good. Wow, except that now it's cycling through the whole <laughs> slide. <laughs> Welcome to moderating. <laughs> Where you think that you have it all planned out, but even when you think you've got it all planned out, some things happen. So um, yes. your mission, um, which we assume you've all chosen to accept, is to enable everyone who's in your session at DLF to be able to have what they came for, which might mean um, listening to a topic that they are really excited to hear about, or might mean actually presenting a topic which they have carefully prepared and scripted in order to present within the time limits. Um, it's, it's really easy to, in the, in the heat of the moment and in the chaos of DLF, which is really exciting and full of energy, to let things slip away from you. And so this session is in part to try and set you up so that you'll be able to prepare and have a smooth experience as a moderator and indeed as a presenter. All right, let's see if, can I advance? Woo, so there are some things that you can do um, in advance before you get to DLF. And indeed, as we are just about three weeks out from the conference, now is a fantastic time to do those things. So um, maybe you've already contacted your panelist, though I can say as someone who's been moderating for a few years now, when I first started moderating, I did not ask about all of these things. Now I do. 
Um, one is slides and backup options, which um, includes things like having an extra thumb drive with their presentation on it in multiple formats. Um, I often recommend that my panelists bring their slides not as PowerPoints or Google Slides, but as PDF documents in part because when you are moving a PowerPoint or a Google Slides presentation sorry, just a PowerPoint, around on computers, sometimes the fonts get all wonky if the computer that you've moved it to doesn't have the same fonts as the computer that you created your presentation on. And um, that can lead to an awkward presentation and happily presenting from a PDF doesn't, um, doesn't require that. I also um, asks ask my panelists about their preferred name pronunciation, especially when I'm dealing with names that I'm not familiar with, because it really matters a lot to me, both as a presenter and um, as a moderator to get my name right. And it's amazing how often, though my name is Paige, people somehow um, mistakenly refer to me as Kate or Faith. Um, so. <laughs> I, I, um, or just confuse my first name with my last name, and it's, it's terribly annoying, um, and I assume that it's very annoying for other people, so I'll ask people, is there a particular syllable that needs emphasis? Um, I really want to get it right. Um, I'll also ask for their affiliation, though I tend to, especially not at conferences where there's a short time schedule, um, not do much of a bio, but sometimes um, affiliation and title. It's really your preference in terms of how you run this, um, but it's good to have a plan and um, nudge people in advance, particularly so that um, if they don't respond right away because they've had a particularly overwhelming week, you can nudge them again before we all get to Vegas. Um, but also there are a number of early logistics that you can cover that will save your time. For example, asking in advance whether, whether there's any reason that your presenters need to present on their own laptops. Because if that's the case, then knowing right away that there may be tech hiccups is really good to know. Um, and likewise, it's really nice to know if no one needs to present from their own laptop because it makes it easier for you to develop a plan for getting all of the presentations onto one laptop in advance ready to be cycled through. Um, other things to um, remind your panelists of are the importance of making slides accessible, and we'll get to that in just a couple of slides, and the fact that after DLF, it is um, indeed possible and encouraged, if they're comfortable with it, to share their presentation slides in the OSF DLF forum repository. And I'll show you that as well in just a moment. So um, accessibility in, is the um, practice of making content available for people who may have visual processing disorders or use screen readers for any number of reasons. Um, we really want, it is, I know, well within the DLF values, that we want the content that we present and the discourse that we share at the forum to be accessible and inclusive and ready for everyone to be able to participate um, in it. And um, much like Helene and I are giving this webinar today, last year, another group of people gave a really fantastic webinar on accessibility. And I'm just going to attempt to <laughs> attempt to show you show you that. Um, it's linked in those slides, obviously, and there is both a recording and slides below that are easy for you to process in whichever way you prefer. And even, even just a little bit of um, a few tweaks can really help increase the accessibility of your slides. For example, um, for 
man, there's, okay, Beach Ball of Doom is gone. For this particular slide deck, I ended up adjusting the colors of the bullet points to make them higher contrast and ended up um, increasing the size of the font on all the slides to make them more accessible. So even, even a few tiny adjustments can really help in that regard. Likewise, um, the OSF repository, I realize I am putting my life in my hands by going in and out of these slides so often, um, is right over right over here. It's possible to log in um, get yourself a membership and then there's a nice little link at the bottom where you can add your poster or talk and um, provide the metadata and then it's really easy to share with people um, and share your presentation afterwards. Helene and I presented last in 2016 and I share the link from our slides um, all the time and it makes it possible for people who are also um, who we don't know, but who are might be interested in the topic that we're presenting on um, to discover those slides um, and find out more about our ongoing research. So, and with that, um, let me shift things over to Helene for a moment. Thanks, Paige. So we still have some things to do in advance of um, before you get to Vegas. Um, as a moderator, it's really important that you understand what the timing is, and we'll talk about that, uh, but also what happens within those assigned times that presenters are going to have. Uh, you need to have your panelists decide, do they want to have Q&A at the end of their presentation, or does the whole group of panelists and presenters decide let's wait until the end of the session and you know allow the 10 minutes or whatever you have uh, for questions at the end where everybody can ask questions of everybody. And so you as a moderator will need to do some, some thinking about this as you contact the panelists by reading the abstracts and seeing are there affinities across the uh, presentations? Can you see where, yeah, maybe it would be good to hold all the questions until the end or if the presentations seem like they're fairly disparate that maybe you have the, the Q&A after each presentation. And so that's something as a moderator, you need to decide and you can get input from the presenters, but you also need to be thinking strategically of, you know, you have so many minutes, how are, you know, Know, 55 minutes, <laughs> how, how are you going to use them so that everybody gets uh, fair timing? Um, and then you also need to think about the presentation time limits. So Paige, next slide, please. There we go. There we go. So all sessions are 55 minutes and here's where the math comes in. And I actually just, I have a post-it note right here where I did the math for the sessions I'm moderating. Um, your sessions might be a combination of nine minute snapshots and 18 minute presentations. And in some cases, if you add up how many presenters or, or panelists you have, you know, you, if there were two 18 minute presentations and one nine minute snapshot, you would end up with 45 minutes. And that gives 10 minutes of kind of uh, squish time where maybe you want to put questions at the end or additional conversation after the questions. If you have a grouping where you have, say, two 18 minute presentations and two nine minute snapshots, that lands you at 54 minutes, right? So that gives you one minute to spare, uh, you know, which is kind of the, the beach ball of doom, <laughs> as Paige was saying, <laughs> as you're swapping out slides or something. And so you really are going to have to be much, much more firmly, you know, adhere to the structure that you set up. And so as you do the math and as you contact your presenters, um, what I have found is useful is to suggest that like, I see that, you know, maybe we can do Q and A after two of the snapshots, or I really think everybody should do Q and A, you know, within their uh, slot. Um, and then what you have to do is ask them how much time, ask your presenters, how much time do you want for the presentation versus the Q&A? So you're gonna have several little columns of math here where you know if there's a, a panel presentation and you've got three people presenting in 18 minutes, those three people have to decide amongst themselves how much time will we take to get through the presentation and how much time do they want for Q&A? Um, and so it's your job as moderator to kind of track all of that. Um, 
one, one of the other things in terms of key timing logistics, I just want to uh, reiterate what Paige said in terms of the slides. If you have a packed session where it's 54, min 54 minutes of content and you've got three different groups wanting to use their own laptops for whatever reason, if people are showing coding and that kind of thing, they may well need to use their own laptop, that's going to bite into their presentation time and they need to be aware of that, that if it's going to take you two minutes to set up, that's coming out of your 18 minutes, uh, that there's not enough uh, flex time because the worst thing for all of us is to be in a presentation where the last speaker doesn't get their time, time. and that's what we're trying to prevent. Yeah. And so there are things you need to to work with your presenters on ahead of time to ensure the the smooth transition between groups and you know know who's going to go first who's going to go second. And so I really prefer to keep the slides on one laptop or one thumb drive. <laughs> um, but I do understand when people need to use their own laptops, it's just then you have to make some decisions about where does that time come out of. Um, I, I have, also, whoops, sorry, Helene, the, I'm go ahead. jumping in. I will say, I have occasionally said, you know, if you have a demo, if you have a demo that you can send to me, I will happily um, flog it on Twitter and try and get people's attention to it. I'm always happy to do whatever I can yeah. to try and make things go smoothly because often I find that people, sometimes people are, are understanding of the fact that setup time has to come out of their actual talking time. And sometimes they're reluctant <laughs> to acknowledge <laughs> that. Um, yes. My pardon for interrupting, Helene. Oh, no oh. problem. No problem. It's a, it's a very good point. And the, the other point I was going to make about the slides is if people can get their slides to the moderators before the session. And I know uh, because I, like everyone else, use that time on the airplane to build my presentation, or maybe I'm the only one, uh, <laughs> 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 that requiring that slides be in, you know, the week before is probably not reasonable. Um, I mean, I would, as a moderator, I would love your slides when you have them, but I also know that the night before is pretty much when I'm going to be putting together uh, either, you know, downloading things to the desktop on my laptop or the thumb drive or creating a PDF. Um, so making sure that your presenters know that you need those in advance, especially if you're collating them, uh, is really, you know, something to really be clear about. All right. Uh, next, uh, next slide page. I was so, like, I almost hit, I almost hit enter on my screen. <laughs> nothing would happen. <laughs> Thank you for driving, Paige. Uh, <laughs> always a pleasure. All right. So timekeeping strategies, and this is this is where I sense that moderators get tentative, right? Because you're you're having to sometimes interrupt people or flag them down mid presentation or what should be towards the end of their presentation to let them know that their time is almost up and so what i do with my panelists is i ask them how would they like to be alerted um do you want me to wave a piece of paper that says two minutes and then one minute or do you want to just hear an alarm go off on a phone or what method is, is preferable and work with people that way. And also, you don't need to be firm and say that time limits are for everyone. It's an equity issue. And last year, what I did that was that actually worked surprisingly good was at the beginning of the session, I just stood up and told the audience that this was how it was going to work as well. That when people were, you know, I would flash the two minute and one minute signs, which is what we had agreed on, but that also that I would cut people off when we reached time, uh, that I would be the mean teacher uh, and do that uh, in order to preserve everyone's time. And that session, which was one of those 54 minute packed sessions, actually went very smoothly because everybody kept to time. So I think announcing your expectations to everybody um, helps because then everybody knows what what to expect. When it comes to uh, timekeeping strategies, like I said, I use signs, I also use my phone, but then I tend to like, oh, wait, they wanted eight minutes for presentation and one minute for Q&A, that setting up that timing like on the spur of, you know, like right when you're there can be confusing. So think in advance about what's, what's gonna keep you on track and not have you flailing around. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is kind of open it up if people have uh, comments or ideas for uh, alerting uh, 
panelists or timekeeping methods that you found to be especially effective. Um, and one of the other things I also want to point out is where do you stand as a moderator when you are timekeeping so um, that you can catch the presenter's attention but not you know, be in front of the audience waving things around. <laughs> and that's something to think about uh, when we get to the room setup. So do people have ideas or suggestions or, or things they hate about uh, timekeeping? I will chime in here and say that I tend to set my um, iPad timer and I set it to end with the quacking duck because um, quacking ducks make people laugh, but also I'm, I'm really serious about timekeeping. I am like Helene, the mean teacher, and um, I found that a quacking, a quacking duck punctures egos. Um, <laughs> and the duck keeps on quacking. Um, I do turn it off, but but um, that is that is my preferred strategy and one which I would expect to have used on me if I ever went over. <laughs> I'm coming to every presentation now in your career now with the <laughs> quacking duck in hand. <laughs> But um, let's see, I don't think I can, I've thrown my chat window off to the side. I do not I, see anything in the chat window about. Um, um, I would also welcome people briefly unmuting themselves if they absolutely. want to share here. All right, they're all just going to take our advice. I like that. <laughs> right. Quacking duck is good. Cowbell yes. is good. Yes. Um, Horn of Gondor. Um, also, also yes. good if you want to give people a, a nobler, a nobler <laughs> exit from their presentation. Some when I do have to stop someone, and there have been times where I have had to cut someone off when I was well aware that they had five more slides or um, three more pages in their paper. And man, I am always sorry to do that, but I, I like, but I'm going to do it. It's my responsibility yeah. to the audience and especially to the panelists as a moderator. And I always say, you know, you are, I'm sure that people would love to talk with you more during the break and encourage them to share their slides, share their full presentation on Twitter, in the repository. Um, again, even though I am being strict about timekeeping, I, I do feel badly for people when, when when they go over and so I'm always happy to help boost attention to their presentation, happy to support them getting their ideas out there in whatever way I can, except by letting them have more time. And I do like Joy's, uh, Joy has um, just said, has anybody ever brought a small gong? Because I, 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 actually, I really like that. So I don't know what the TSA will see if that will say, but we're going to Vegas. They can't say anything, right? In terms of like, why, why do you have a gong in your suitcase? Can you buy a gong in Vegas? I mean, I feel I've never been to Vegas, but I feel like you can you can buy a lot of things in Vegas. You, you know, can buy an Elvis impersonator. So surely you can buy a gong. I'm thinking you could rent a really b a large gong. Okay, oh. okay, but 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 we digress because now this yes we could. <laughs> we could <go laughs> Sorry, right. TLS really... the Gong Show edition. Yes, Josh, you're totally. <laughs> um, um, and well, and I Diego... just th this is Dan at OSU, and I would suggest too that as we follow up before is that we have to reinforce with the presenters that it's yeah. their responsibility to yes. their fellow presenters because I've been burned a couple of times where I'm the person caught near the end that I can't do yeah. mine, and not only does that you know make the rest of us rush through it also when you finally get to those those um uh reviews of that session those sessions look awful and you appear awful yeah. because the session was taken up by someone and it's it's just it's their responsibility to practice to script to whatever and then yeah. it's our responsibility to be positioned in such a way as to say your time is up you need to sit down Great. I, I agree, Dan. And that is something that I work on with my presenters is once we started that initial conversation, and we're doing the planning, I reiterate, here's how much time you have, here's how much time you have. And then I also do it the day of to remind them. And then I ask them, you know, are, do you have a timer? Or are you going to rely on my timer? Um, and this kind of touches on what Diego uh, was writing that, that you ask people, you know, when do you want a reminder? Do you want, uh, you know, a, a reminder at five minutes before, at two minutes before? Um, because it's really easy to accommodate everybody's uh, on your panel that way, if you know these people want a five minute warning, these other people want a two minute warning. So 
Yep. And I have also occasionally looked no, not occasionally, always now, I look at my presenters' slide decks when they send them to me, and yes. I see, gosh, do they have 60 slides in here for a nine-minute snapshot? Um, because unless they're planning um, a flipbook presentation, that's that's not going to happen. So um, right. this man, being this assertive with people, has taken practice um, for me, and yeah. It has, I was not always the strict moderator. I am now and people thank me for it and they will thank you too. And I continue to aspire to find new ways to be a good and supportive moderator as I move on in my career. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it takes practice and it takes nerve because maybe you asked to moderate a session that somebody who you really admire is presenting at and, you know, you're, you feel like on the spot that, oh, this is a, you know, a famous person in our field and, you know, here I am telling them, you know, that their, their time is up. But that's why this is preparation is really important. And to answer Perry's column, uh, Perry Collins's question, yes, the presentation time usually the, that 55 minutes um, where it's broken down into 18 and nine minute slots, those 18 and nine minute slots do include Q&A unless you have a session that doesn't fill the whole 55 minutes um, where you might have um, some flexibility in terms of timing. And so, yes, I do ask my presenters, how much time do you want for your presentation and, you know, what kind of warning, five minute, two minute, whatever. And then when they get into the Q and A, if it's two minutes, you know, which goes really <laughs> quickly, um, you know, I give them a one minute warning. And then um, we'll also mention this later that it is TLF and, and it's, I, I love this conference because of it, it's inclusive, it's a conversation, it's a dialogue. We also have to cut off the Q and A um, and to remind people that they can, they can connect in the hallway outside, they can connect on Twitter, they can reach out uh, via email to follow up with questions that they have. And something that I realized we didn't put into the earlier slides, but I wish we had, um, we might do that before they go into the repository, is reminding people, making sure that people understand that that 18 minute time is, does include not just their presentation, right. but, the, but the discussion period, because that's not always, that's um, not always clear, or even if the DLF has made it clear in announcements, people are busy. They don't always read their emails carefully. Um, I don't always read my emails carefully, though I aspire to. Um, but just to just to be frank and honest here, um, yeah. I see my job as the moderator is, make, is to make sure that everyone is really clear um, on the boundaries and guidelines and how much time they will have. So. Agreed. And I, I like what Joy Joey just posted um, that she's moderating a mixed session and that uh, the 18 minute presenters have volunteered to give up some of their time to have a buffer for Q&A at the end. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful when that happens. And that's, yeah, that's why we start planning early to ask the whole group, what do you prefer? Um, and when that kind of collaboration happens, that's that's great. And Brandon, you're, abs you're absolutely right that you're gonna feel worse telling that last panelist, sorry, we're out of time. Um, than telling the first person, okay, your time is up. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. All right. I think maybe we are ready to move on from timekeeping strategies. Yes. Um, so, um, there are a number of things you can do once you get to DLF, um, including creating a prep sheet of notes um, though you could also do this before, um, but this is my handy dandy map to actually managing my, my sessions. And you can see an illustration of what a typical prep sheet looks like for me, um, which includes that set of reminders to tell people, tell, tell people about, um, and my presenters and their affiliations and the um, phonetic spelling um, or uh, not not typical phonetics. I cannot write in the phonetic alphabet, but um, a mnemonic guide for me to be able to actually pronounce their names correctly. Um, 
in a way that I will understand. Um, but also, obviously, um, well, not obviously. The first time that I moderated a session, I did not think to find the room in advance, and um, and I. But I do now. Um, so finding the room in advance, especially if the hotel is is sort of a um, rabbit warren of of corridors that all look the same, um, finding the landmarks that will help you find that session again, um, and if you if you are sensing that I have found myself lost in a hotel when I was trying to get to the session to present or moderate, then you would be absolutely correct. Um, so, and being aware that DLF is really incredible and sets what I would consider the gold standard in terms of providing tech support when things go wrong. Um, and they do this through the hashtag DLF Village. So being aware that if anyone is having having a rough time in the setup or as things get going, that you can um, tweet on that hashtag and know that DLF will respond is really good to know. Um, so, so because moderating is challenging and the, the organizers of the conference really want to help you as much as possible. Um, so, and as Catherine says, yes, they're always there at the registration desk if they need immediate tech support. And so I just want to add one thing here, and that is, as a moderator, be aware if you need a dongle uh, for your laptop or if the presenters who want to use their own laptops, the, we're responsible for our own dongles. And uh, DLF usually has, you have some we can check out, but if all the ones you need are already checked out. Um, last year, I was very successful using the DLF Village <laughs> uh, hashtag to get a dongle at the last minute because I had not realized uh, which kind I would need. Um, so now I have a whole pack, pack of dongles, uh, no gong, but dongles uh, that come with me um, to make sure that I can connect. Um. Thank you for mentioning that, mentioning that, Helene, because I meant to cover it in the um, in the advanced prep um, before. But that's also something that you can remind your presenters of. And um, I have, I have, I think, occasionally um, in the opening session of DLF, just use the hashtag to say, "Hey, um, just a reminder. Do you have a dong?" Did you remember to bring your dongle? If you didn't, let your moderator know or, or post to coordinate sharing. Um, everyone forgets their dongle some of the time and the community has been um, really good at, um, at being able to step up and, and occasionally loan dongles. Um, I have I have occasionally run run my dongle to another room um, in order to make a presentation work. Um, happily, mine is both DVI and Mini VGA compliant. Um, so so um, if we have a surplus of dongles, all the better. But exactly. um, um, much less stressful than having um, a shortage yeah. of, and of it, dongles. Exactly. Brandon asks a question of, is it safe to assume there will be HDMI in every room? And that's a great question, Brandon. And I'm going to, if uh, Becca or Aaliyah or anybody else at DLF knows, that's, that's a great question for them because then we will know in terms of dongle packing uh, <laughs> what, what to assume. And so if we don't find out within this session, um, we'll find out later and then um, get that word out. Yep. Um, so moving on, um, DLF is, one of the great things about DLF is that people are so participatory and that as the presenters are speaking, often people in the audience are commenting, um, making notes of what they've said and um, adding their, adding extra resources. So DLF is my favorite, favorite conference in that I, it's the one where I feel least badly about the fact that I can't be in five different places at once because at least I can go and read the notes and their um, bit.ly link goes to a Google Drive folder where they have already set up, um, started to set up folders for and documents by day and if you click in 
to the day, then you will get a list of the different sessions. So they've made it as easy as possible for everyone to everyone to contribute. Um, so it's really easy to refer people to that. Let's go back to full screen mode. And of course, there are the two um, two overarching hashtags for DLF Forum and Digital Preservation for 2018, but also sh um, three, three character hashtags for each different session. So um, if you can encourage your audiences to use both of the appropriate hashtags, both the broad and the specific session hashtag, that's really great. I always appreciate as an audience member being reminded of what this actual session is because otherwise I get to thinking of the hashtag where so-and-so is presenting or, or sorry, the session where so-and-so is presenting or the session where they are talking about sunset plans, which are one of my favorite things. Um, so I never mind being reminded, hey, this is session M1C, etc. Um, please use it if you can. And man, this year I think is the first year that we'll have have 280 characters for um, conference reading instead of 140. So they're really, I, I hope that'll mean that there's always time to, always space to use both the specific session hashtag and the overall forum hashtag. Um, so, so, um, Moving on from there. Um, oh, I think I'm passing this back to Helene. Yes. Yes, and I want I just want to note that as a moderator, I typically will make a one slide for the session so it's on the screen as people filter in and sit down that does have the URL for the notes and the hashtags um, so that people can get that, you know, that they see it written down. Um, a few minutes before the session starts so they can they can set up what they need to set up <laughs> on Twitter or in the Google Doc. Um, so at the start of the session, it's your job as a moderator to provide the structure of the session. And so I typically, uh, I will do some kind of pre-checks like, okay, number one, where's the room? Don't get lost on the way to the room. Uh, making sure speakers have something to drink if they want that. Um, and then setting up the structure of the time by saying we have two 18 minute presentations and two nine minute presentations. Q&A will happen during those 18 and nine minute sessions or however we've structured it um, because that reminds every that tells everybody in the audience what to expect and it reminds the speakers one last time that there there are time limits um, I also remind everyone to use the microphone uh, I don't care how much of, a, of a, a mean teacher you are you and you have a great teacher voice you still need to use the microphone um, and so that part of what that might mean is that you as the moderator may need to either take a microphone around or remind people to move to the microphone when they have questions um, and to make sure that the presenters are speaking into the microphone. Uh, and again remind everybody about the hashtags and the note-taking documents and um, as I said earlier, think about where you can stand, where you're not in the way of the audience, uh, but you can catch the presenter's eye uh, in order to, to keep time. And so a lot of times that means you, can, you should sit in the front row. And as we all know, it's hard to get people to sit in the front row anyway. Uh, they all want to crowd in the back. Um, in case they hate your moderating and they want to leave the session. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but sit, sitting in the front where you're making eye contact with the speakers, um, I find that helpful. And then this is where as um, a moderator, your timekeeping skills are going to come into play where, first of all, um, you don't want to take up a lot of time at the start of the session because you're cutting into presenter time. Um, and so this is why we ask that moderators just introduce speakers using their name and their affiliation. Because if speakers want to give more context, they can do that as part of their presentation. Um, and then, you know, you, you do the introductions, you sit down and hit your timer. Um, and this is where your little post-it notes of how much time and how much time for question and answers kind of kind of come into play. So if you've got a prep sheet like Paige has uh, or a spreadsheet, uh, you know, we are keeping track of all this. This is the time where that really comes into play. Um, next slide, please. Okay. 
Thank you. So um, as you've started your timer and you're listening to the presentation and you're kind of monitoring things, if you, ha if you have the bandwidth, uh, try to watch that hashtag and see what is catching people's attention. What, is, what are they taking away from the session? Um, what, are they, what are they saying either about the content or about the projects or whatever, you know, what is it that's being promoted about this session because this may come in handy when you get to the Q&A. Um, because you as moderator, you're gonna moderate the Q&A um, and it's up to you to figure out what some questions might be if the audience doesn't instantly reach out with questions. And um, a lot of times that watching the hashtag will give you some idea of like, wow, three people have commented on X, you know, so presenter mm -hmm. Y, maybe, you know, can you talk a minute about this? Or you as moderator can talk about um, how you see the, the pieces fitting together from the different panelists that were, um, that were talking. So again, that takes up a lot of your mental bandwidth where you're watching a timer, you might be showing the sign, you know, for warning, you know, two minutes, one minute, uh, watching a hashtag and trying to listen to the presentation. And so we know that that's a lot. And so if you don't get to the hashtag, you don't, you know, Managed. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Exactly. Exactly. But it's also why as a moderator, you know, do make sure you have read the abstracts of the presenter so you can at least, you know, come up with a question if there's, you know, silence after the, after the presentations. I have occasionally um, as well asked my panelists, is there a question that you wish that someone would ask you about this? And, and that can I mean, I also note note my own questions about about their their topic in advance. That's why reading the abstracts is really important. But for for whatever reason, um, sometimes for some people, it's really interesting to be asked, "What is it that you wish that people would ask you about?" And sometimes you have something that you'd like like them to say. So feel free in that regard to offer to play their essentially ringer audience member um, in order to save yourself save yourself bandwidth because both Helene and I know that there is a lot going on and the point of this session and our guidance is not to convince you that you need to I don't know, achieve, achieve moderation perfection by doing all the things because <laughs> you really don't. Um, we think that timekeeping is the most, the most important by, by a long ways. And these other suggestions are just to try and help you prepare for things to go as smoothly, as smoothly as possible as the session host. So, and I think that segues us right into Q and A um, and the closing session. It does indeed. So um, you're almost done at this point. So again, as Helene said, you're cutting into time um, with how much time you take up. But it is worth reminding audience members to be concise. If their questions are long, save them for talking afterwards. Um, ask questions, not not comments. Um, and remind people, particularly if, if you're in a room where you know that you're going to need to pass a mic around, remind them to signal to you so that you can bring the mic to them. Um, and because it's really frustrating for both presenters and other audience members not to be able to hear the question clearly. And it is not difficult to prepare in such a way that you can avoid that. So sometimes there is a lull before questions and it can be tricky to balance when you're going to be quiet and let the audience catch its breath and, and um, start to speak up versus when you are going to jump in and note that perhaps two of the sessions um, ran parallel around a particular topic um, or that all three of the sessions had incredible contrasts between 
between them on a, a particular, particular topic and invite the panelists to speak with each other on that. If you can, and sometimes this is necessary and sometimes it's not, um, as a moderator, I try to balance the Q&A between panelists so that um, even if there is one panelist that particularly really um, their topic really set the room on fire, that that, that topic does not take up the entire Q&A. Um, and of course, some of this depends on whether you've decided to do Q&A after each, after each presentation or all together at the end. But I always feel slightly badly for, for people if, if one, pa one presentation was so dominant that the others just didn't get any questions at all. Sometimes that's the way it goes. Um, it is not your responsibility to make the session perfect, but it's something that I try to keep in mind and find it useful to remind myself of um, just as I'm going in so that I'm fully prepared. And um, as, as you get to the end of that 55 minutes, you need to of course close things down so that the next next group will have as much prep time as they need and sometimes depending on how people are getting to and from the conference that prep time is really important to them um, because they may not have been in Vegas for that long and so they're really counting on having that time to work out tech kinks especially if they're doing any sort of live demo which sometimes people who are braver than me um, will do. Um, so do please feel um, authoritative enough to remind the audience and panelists that the session is now done, but that they can con continue to discuss um, the topics beyond the bounds of the session, um, just not within the formal confines of the panel. And remind panelists about using the OSF repository for slides. And of course, um, say thank you to the presenters and the audience for their participation either as speakers or as listeners um, and and i find that that's usually a good note to to say goodbye on um, so with that um we are ready to well, <laughs> not say goodbye um there's there's plenty of time but we're happy to take questions, but also open up the floor to other people who have experience moderating, who have seen various, various situations that they want to comment on, share responses and strategies for, etc. cetera. Um, really, over to all of you. And thank you, Helene, for monitoring the chat since I have, since I have not been. Um, Your screen was full. So. <laughs> was indeed. So as as Paige said, yeah, we're we're glad to answer questions or you know discuss anything. Um, if you have comments, ideas, think you want to fly by us or each other to, you know, how about X? I mean, I'm really now onto the gong thing. I have to say that whoever put that in my head, I'm not sure. I thank you, uh, but uh, it will. <laughs> you know, you could also you could you could hit the gong with your dongle. Um, oh, well, so <laughs> a gongle, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm getting I'm getting a bit punchy here. It's been a long week. Oh. Exactly. So Karen has a question: If it, can a speaker elect to give up Q and A time in order to talk a little longer? Absolutely. It's up to the speakers what they want to do. And I have had speakers, especially if they put in a proposal for a longer session, but it was cut down to a snapshot level where they said, I'm not gonna do any Q&A during the session. I'm glad to talk with people outside of the session, whether it's in the hallway or over Twitter or email, whatever. So it's, yeah, it really is up to each presenter uh, as to what they wanna do. I think too, as the moderator, it's good for you to check with that in advance and then be able to announce it to the audience so that they know they can be thinking of questions, but hang on to them to talk with presenters later. Exactly, exactly. So excellent, thanks Karen, that's a really good question.
<laughs> and I, I will also reiterate that it can be intimidating to be a moderator that um, like, how do I say no or stop talking in front of all these people? Um, I think you will find that people are very grateful that you do that. I mean, the number of thank yous I got from last year when I said, okay, I'm the mean teacher and I'm going to cut people off if I need to. Uh, it was astounding that people were like, yes, that's what we want. And so even though you might feel like you're being mean, you're actually really doing a service to the entire group. Um, and as professionals, you know, we, we are used to having limits and boundaries and it's, it's good to be kept to them. And I do, I do ask my presenters to at least practice their talks so they have a sense of how long it is. And if you see 60 slides in the deck, as Paige said, then you can consult with them and say, you know, are, are, you're loading these onto OSF and you're only really talking about the first 10, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So... Other questions or comments? I am also happy to back you up um, if you feel like there's someone who you, you can't say no to. Um, uh, so Kate asks, what do you do with a person who just won't stop talking, <laughs> give up the floor? And um, man, that is... That is a really hard one, though I suspect that DLF is a really responsive and actively participatory community. So um, I think you might find people using the DLF village, village hashtag um, to, to call for backup if, if needed, but I have in, in one instance, um, several years ago at a different conference, I did actually get directly in front of the person um, and say, I'm sorry, it's time to, it's, it's time to transition. And um, that did, that did um, startle the person enough um, that that they did eventually, um, they, that they did sit down at that point. So, um, but man, it, it can be a really, I think that all of us, and in this I include not only Helene, but Becca and Quan and the DLF organizers, we know that moderating can be a really hard job. And I wish, I wish there were a way that we could just um, guarantee that everything would go smoothly. And of course we can't. So we want to give you as much, as much support and pre-endorsement of the value of timekeeping as possible beforehand. So, so and if you have a bad experience, um, f I'm, I'm happy, happy to listen to you, um, happy to support you after the fact. Um, yeah. I really hope that that won't happen, but, yeah. um, but one always hopes that that won't happen, and sometimes it does. Yes, I, I agree that um, I think at this conference especially, you're, it's less likely to happen, especially as a moderator, if you stood up and sort of set up the structure here's what we're doing here's how it's going to work and and that you've talked with your presenters before and i'm thinking about my experience not just as a moderator but as an instructor and that it's really been only once in all my years of teaching which number many at this point uh that i have had to actively cut somebody off um in the classroom somebody who you know ignored all the warning signs who ignored signs from the rest of the presenters in their group and i finally had to cut off their microphone um <laughs> But, but that was a really radical, you know, for me, and I, I was just terrified, of course, like, here's a student, right? Uh, but I, yes, we hope that doesn't happen. If you, if you feel that you're not communicating well with one of your presenters as things are ramping up and you're doing your, um, you know, preparation, I, I would say reach out to either myself or Paige. Um, or to Becca or, to Becca or, or, or Alia. Yes. Yeah, I'll jump in and say that um, if something along those lines happens, we're more than happy to talk about it with you and to help smooth things over with 
the presenter if that's necessary. Um, myself, Catherine, and Aaliyah will be around all the time, so just come find one of us. Yeah, and in Helene and I are are in endorsing the the firm mean teacher um, sort of perspective. We're not trying to encourage you to get into a conflict with your panelists. So please do. Um, sometimes it is easier to to mediate these things with someone else behind you. We always recommend getting the support you need rather than feeling like you have to um, have to go into a really conflict, heavy conflict situation. So um, that's, that's um, important. Joy also comments that, um, that she's got somebody in her session who does need to use their own laptop and she has um, rearrange, recommended rearranging the session so that they go last. Um, so since they can't put their slides in a deck with everyone else's and I think that that's a great that's a great workaround. Um, I have also been been up front with people about um, saying I know you're planning on doing a live demo but I really recommend that just in case of tech tech hiccups um, you have a backup version that does not involve a live demo. Happily too um, you are likely to, as long as you're not moderating in the very first session of the day, there's a decent chance that you'll have a clearer sense of how well the Wi-Fi and how well the setup is working. So, um, and I know that this is true of many, many digital, digital humanities, digital libraries, conferences that I've been to, that the venue says oh of course we can handle of course we can handle a thousand people on our wi-fi tweeting all at once um we handle that all the time and then then the librarians descend and um <laughs> and they had no idea and they had no idea <laughs> so if you know from talking with people or from watching the hashtag that there are tech issues and you know that people on your on your presentation are planning live demos um, I I would potentially send a quick email to them saying hey as you've probably noticed um, the tech is a little bit bumpy so if you've got a backup then come and be prepared to use it um, because there is alas no pausing the session while we <laughs> No, no putting a time pause on the session while exactly. we sort out the tech problems. Um, when I get exactly. a time turner or a TARDIS, I will let you all yeah. know. I will share it with the DLF, but we don't have that. So, um, exactly. so warn, just being alert and making, helping your panelists be alert is, is a really good option. Yes. And like I, like I said, the, the folks at DLF, the folks who come to DLF, um, a we have a shared set of values. And so um, I think you're less likely to encounter issues with, you know, pushback on the timing if you've been very upfront and, you know, everybody presenting during that hour has the, has the structure. Yeah. So other, other questions or comments? And if people are watching this later as a recording, uh, do know that you can reach out to myself or Paige uh, if you have follow-up. We're, we're glad to do that. We're on email, we're on Twitter, um, we're, we're all around um, pretty much all the time. Right. Um. <laughs> and if you want to learn about doing group work and surviving, you can come to my MLIS orientation shortly. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Um, looks like we're wrapping yeah. up. So thank you so much, all of you, for taking an hour out of what I can only imagine are terrifically busy weeks. It is either either um, the fourth week of your semester or just the prelude to the first week of your quarter, I think, depending on where you are. And yes. we both know that that is crazy yes. busy time for, um, yeah. for lots of people, for yes. 
various reasons. Yeah. So. Yes, and thanks to DLF for uh, for sponsoring help, this, help, helping us make this happen uh, in response to requests. So thank you, everybody there. And we will look forward to seeing you all in in Las Vegas, Vegas. next yeah. month. That's oh. right. With or without your gong. <laughs> or your dongle. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This recording will be up on our website um, by tomorrow. So look forward to awesome. it. Thanks, everybody. Thank okay. you, Becca. All bye -bye. right. Thanks, Becca. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.